Today we have the Ground Zero Uranium 6 channel amplifier, model number GZUA 6.200 SQ+. It's a 6 channel amplifier with 1400 watts max, 2 ohm stable, and adjustable bias control. That in itself is one of the coolest features built into this amplifier, which we're going to talk about of course. So let's open this thing up and take a look at what comes in it. First up, right on top, is the owner's manual. Two copies of it, one in English, one in German. There's a little envelope here off to the side. Inside of that is the mounting brackets for the amplifier. They have a piece of cardboard between them so they don't get scratched. Piece of foam. This is the amplifier, and you'll notice it's like, it's kind of unique. It's got a, like, it's a pillow, and it's heavy. Really heavy. Ugh. Stand it up on one side and slowly pull it out. Yeah. Ooh, soft. This monster is what is inside. First off, it's huge. Let's find out just how big. Without the feet attached, we're at 21 and 3 quarters long, 8 and a quarter inches deep, 1 and 7 eighths inches tall. This is a big amplifier. Big footprint goes back to the good old days where, like, if you wanted a high quality amplifier, it was going to be big. And this is big. I'll take it a minute to go back to the owner's manual, which is where all the specs are. They make three amplifiers in this series, a 2 2500, a 4 150, and of course the 6 200, which is right here. Common features, they're all 2 ohm stable on the stereo channels, 1 ohm stable on the 2 2550 per channel that's not bridged, so it'll do 1 ohm on channel 1 and 1 ohm on channel 2. Adjustable bias controls for each channel separately, high end WEMO capacity latest Burr Brown operational amplifier, status LEDs, wide band adjustable high pass and low pass filters, band patch feature with active low pass high pass filters, adjustable input sensitivity, soft delayed remote turn on. And then if you're getting into the 2.250, this basically the sub amp of this, you have a bass control, phase shift, bass boost, and then they all have thermal speaker short circuit overload, overcurrent protection, and a temperature sensor controlled cooling fan. Now for those of you that don't take the time or the pleasure to read an, an owner's manual, well, you should. Not for the fact that it's an owner's manual that's telling you what to do, which none of us like to be told what to do, but just because of what they put into the actual owner's manual. It's a lot of common sense stuff that, well, let's be honest, a lot of people don't necessarily use common sense. As a precaution, it is recommended to disconnect the battery. Power supply wire has to be protected within eight inches of the main fuse holder with matching fuse value. That's saying that they want a fuse holder within eight inches of the battery, and they want it to add up to the amount of fusing the amplifier has on it. This has 430 amp fuse. It's 120 amps. They want you to put a 120 amp fuse underneath the hood within eight inches. If necessary, place a defective fuse, buy a new one of identical value. Never drill a hole in a vehicle's gas tank, brake lines, or any other important vehicle part. Never pass wires over sharp edges. Keep the wiring away from antennas and electrical devices contributing to radio reception. Install power supply wiring locally separated from the speaker wiring. Basically run power down one side, speaker down the other. The amplifier contains a temperature protection circuit that turns the device off in the case of overheating. Once cooled down, it'll Turn back on. Therefore, don't put something over the top of the amplifier. The amplifier should not be mounted on a strongly vibrating part or surface, i.e. subwoofer enclosures. Don't mount this to a subwoofer enclosure. Ah, it's right there. If pre-amplifier outputs, RCAs, are available on the head unit, it's recommended to make use of them. And then the warning down here says don't play it loud, you could lose your hearing. These are always fun to read. So that takes us through the, the basics of any amplifier you're gonna install. This is kind of like the common sense page. But once we flip over onto page two, now we get the goodies. They give you a breakdown of all three of the amplifiers in case you're wondering what they were and how they're used. Ours is the one here on the bottom, which we'll actually just take a look at the physical amplifier and go over all these things here. The amplifier is broken into four segments. Over here on the far right, we have the power input side. Then we have channels five and six three and four, 
and one and two. They're basically all the same with the exception of two switches, one here and one here. Those are mode two and mode four. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's take a look at all these other things first. Channel one and two is 110 watts by two at four ohms, 160 watts by two at two ohms. You can also bridge it at four ohms and it'll give you 320 watts. For wiring, it starts with channel one, positive, negative, and then channel two is also positive and negative. For bridging, use channel one positive, channel two negative. First up is the low pass crossover, which is variable between 20 and 400 hertz, as well as 200 to 4,000. And how that's achieved is by this switch here, which is a one time or times 10 multiplier switch. If left out like it is now, it'll just be the 200 400 if you press it in it turns it to 200 and 4,000 you can turn the low pass filter on or off the high pass clones the same frequencies that 20 to 400 200 to 4,000 the 10 time multiplier switch is also in the same spot as well as the on and off these are like this, so if you wanted, you could use channels one and two for a subwoofer, you could use channels one and two for a tweeter, or you could use channel one and two for a mid bass. Because if you turn both of these on, you now have a bandpass channel, allowing you to use both the high pass and low pass filter. All the channels on the amplifier are going to clone this same setup. That means that every channel on the amplifier is a high pass, low pass, or bandpass output. The very last knob located here is your gain control, which is one to six volts of variation. That input mode two switch is located next to the RCAs. To turn on input mode two, press the button in, to turn it off, leave the button out. We'll come back to these. Channel three and four is next, and it is a mirrored image of channels one and two. It's gonna start with the input four mode, on and off, the gain control, your high pass, and your low pass crossover. This channel also mirrors the same power, that 110 watts by two, or the 160 at two ohms, 320 mono. Which takes us to five and six. Five and six, first up is the gain control. It also has the bandpass crossover. What makes channel five and six different from one through four is we now have 160 watts at four ohms, 280 watts at two ohms, and a 560 watts if we bridge it at four ohm essentially turning this into a five channel amplifier. Power and protect lights are located next to the speakers. White is on and functioning perfectly. Red is in protect. The four 30 amp fuses, as well as battery, four gauge input, remote, and ground is the last one located here. Mode two and mode four. Those are a really cool feature built into this amplifier depending on how you want to use it. If both of them are off, it's a six channel input. If you're gonna use it as a five channel amplifier, which I know a lot of people you probably will, you have front input, rear input, and sub. If you wanted to use this amplifier to do, let's say a three way set, tweeter, mid range, mid bass if you push in mode two what that'll allow you to do is just run a single rca into inputs one and two and they will populate all the others so channel one will populate three and five channel two will populate four and six that allows you to use all the bandpass crossovers that are on this and just have one set of inputs in Mode four allows you to run a single RCA into one and two, but when pressed, we'll have three and four populate five and six. This one is kind of interesting. The idea behind it is that one and two would be front, three and four would be rear, and then five and six would just come off of your rear. However, there's a lot more options for that one that I'd like to talk about. Keep in mind that five and six have more power, it's 160 watts. If we were to turn this on, mode four, right off the bat, if we used one and two for rear, that would put the front RCA into this and use that to populate channels five and six. The reason for that is being able to control your subwoofer with your fronts. If you're using this in a factory system, most of the time the fronts have more bass output. You wouldn't want to use the rears to power the subwoofer. One of the other options for this, which is for what I was thinking about doing, channel one and two can be your sub channel. 
I know what you're thinking, it's only 320 watts. But if you're running just a single subwoofer, 320 watts of that subwoofer is a decent amount of power. That will allow us to run 110 watts to the tweeter and 160 watts to the mid base. So we get a ton of mid base. That's I think how we're actually going to hook this up in the lab. Another option for hooking this up is if you're gonna use it as a true high zamp, in which case you could run rear into one and two and use this for the rear speaker. And then if you had a set of components up front, run front into three and four and do the same thing we just talked about. Use channels three and four to power your tweeters, five and six to power your mid base. You wanna pay attention when you're doing one of these staggered power amplifiers where the bigger channel goes. Along with some of the ideas that we just gave you on mode two and mode four, in the owner's manual, they do put a considerable amount of time into showing you other options of what we talked about. This whole section here on these two pages, as well as the last page here, kinda of goes over some options that you may be interested in doing. But I guess the one thing to keep in mind is that all the channels are full range channels. They're all bridgeable and you could do a lot of things with them. Get to the bias control. It's located on the bottom of the amplifier. So let's flip this thing over. Here are the three bias controls, channel one and two, three and four, and way over here are five and six. What do they do? Bias setting affects the operation mode of the amplifier. It is a continuously adjustable min actual class AB mode to max closer to class A mode. An amplifier in class A mode sounds warm and creates a pleasant atmosphere. Compared to that, the class AB mode of an amplifier sounds more direct and dynamic. What that means for you and I is let's say we're gonna run tweeters on one and two, mid bass here and a subwoofer on five and six. Tweeters of course are the speaker that really it's where the sizzle is. We'd set this up for maximum bias, more like the class A like they're describing. The mid range, well, we'd probably go about halfway on it. We want it to still sound very rich and dynamic, but we don't need to go full class A. The subwoofer, we just want this thing to, to just bang. So we're gonna set that all the way down to min, closer to that class A, B, because we just want a very powerful sound. And we want to do it as efficiently as possible. And with efficiency, that takes us to the next part. Depending on the bias settings, the current consumption of the amplifier is growing the closer the operation comes to class A mode, leading to an increased temperature. The power rating, however, remains identical. So naturally, the harder you work the amplifier, the more heat the amplifier is going to create. This function here intrigues me. I can't wait to get this in the car because I've never set up an amplifier with adjustable bias. Definitely want to see how that works and we will be doing some A-B comparisons between with it down and with it up. But as far as the heatsink goes and all of that, well I know you guys want to see what's underneath this because you can see that row of capacitors right there and I know it just has to be tantalized. I'm going to pop the top off this. With the bottom off we'll do a slow pan over the top of the amplifier so you can take in all the joy. The MOSFETs are all located on the bottom side of the amp board here. They're not attached to the back wall. The fan is located here. This is a large open cavity for that air to blow in. On the opposite side of the amplifier, it is a perforated area. I'm just kind of digging the color, I'm not gonna lie. I really like the contrast between the red and the orange. It just looks very pleasing to the eye, for sure. There's no doubt about it. With the bottom back on, let's take a look at how the bottom brackets attach. One other thing I'd like to note is this sticker right over here. This is a description of what the mode 2 and 4 button do. In case you go to install it and you forget what it's for, it's located on the bottom of the amplifier. I'm assuming that's for much later down the road if someone were to pick one of these up and they didn't have the owner's manual. One other thing that's located in the box is this little guy right here, which is a bag of screws. In the bag of screws, we also have a backup set of fuses. There are four large coarse head screws used to attach this to to the bracket that you're gonna make for it. And then there's six smaller machine screws to attach the legs. The legs, if you'll notice, have this little bend in them. That is so they can clear the side of the amplifier. There's three holes located here, as well as three identical holes located on the other side. Place the two brackets in place. Now keep in mind, you could also do some form of a custom mount if you wanted where you don't have to use these. It's entirely up to you. It is a Phillips thread. 
And now you have two screw holes located on either end of the amplifier to affix it to whatever you're gonna mount it to. Now a couple of more specifications about this amplifier that some of you may be interested in. Dampening factor is greater than 150. Frequency response is 10 to 30,000 hertz. Input sensitivity is one to six volts, plus or minus 5%. And with that, we're gonna start getting this into the car so we can hear how it sounds. 